This is for the nerds, this is for the brainiacs, this is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back, you ain't gonna touch me, you not gonna do nothing, you are not above me, I bet you wish you was me, I know that I know. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Only Friends podcast. We're here, we're <laughs> popping. We are down. Man, we lost Melissa for the day. What episode is this? Of what, what 116. Edition? edition number 116? Wow, I can't believe we're 116. Really? 116? <laughs> you said it, not me, man. <laughs> I was thinking before the show started how we do show up here like every fucking day, Monday to Friday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're goddamn right. We just show up. We're know? the Lunch Pell Kids. The who? The lunch pail kids. That's what we're blue collar. We bring our we bring our lunch pails with us to work our twelve hour days. What is a lunch pail? Oh man, so soft. This kid is so soft. Yeah. What's a lunch pail? Who's David Einhorn? We're really man. going through it all. What the blue collar workers put their lunch in? Yeah, you got a thermos, a lunch box, but they call it a lunch pail. Oh. Well, it was a pail because it had right. to be steel so right. that, you know, your shit stayed fresh. I see. Mm-hmm. And those yeah, hot-ass coal mines. Thermos and, in there. Yeah. I'm thermos so, of coffee. Yeah. I'm maybe sorry. Maybe a little soup. I'm sorry I've never worked in a coal mine, man. Maybe, <laughs> maybe some Irish coffee, if you will. Lamana, you know, maybe get you through the day. you should work in a coal mine for a few years, you know, toughen your ass a up. A few years? <laughs> uh, th- all right. So this is a bit of an aside from where we're starting, but uh, this is a conversation that I actually think is worth having. So... Uh, I've had this conversation a bunch and I, I dig my heels into it even more and more every time I have it. And I think maybe it's a little bit of a byproduct of how I was born or how I was raised, but, um, we can all agree that with every passing year, the, the first world nations, they tend to get a bit softer, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think we can come to an agreement on that where, you know, people of affluence are just completely ill-exposed to uh, the, the downside of humanity. The hardships yeah. of life. Yeah, the hardships of life, if you will, right? Like the greatest generation thought the next generation was soft, and then they thought that generation thought we were soft, and now we think... Right, well, I can recognize that our generation is soft, but <laughs> goddamn if the next generation isn't like <laughs> marshmallow puff children, right? Wow. So... MF- uh, MPCs. So this is something... <laughs> why is everything an abbreviation with you? Because the Marshmallow Puff Children. I understand what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> My question still remains. Because it's a good one. Okay. It sure. is a good one, right? I mean, it's, it's better than whatever you try to do with the Neil Donald bit. <laughs> what bit? Whenever we were talking about CSM and Neil Donald and you go, C-S- N-D. N-D-O-D. Yeah. Oh, the cocksucker Neil McDonald or whatever. Neil, Neil McDonald? <laughs> That's all right. You don't need to ever remember his name. Yeah, he should be called Neil McDonald. No, but so... Uh, <laughs> Old so, McDonald. Uh, not that I'm ever going to have children, but, but something I've put a lot of thought into is that I think it's really critical it, as, as a parent to offer guidance and exposure to hardships in life. And the thing is, is that you can't really do it synthetically, right? Like if, if you're not born into hardship, you can't really recreate it necessarily speaking. Right. And I don't think it's very genuine to do so. So I think a lot of people mistake this where it's like, uh, you know, you kind of grew up with nothing and then you found affluence in adulthood. Mm-hmm. And so you want to deprive your children of some of their privilege. And so like maybe you don't give them a phone until they're a certain age and it's older than all their peers or, you know, you... Uh, don't allow them to have a TV in the room for similar reasons, whatever. <clears throat> uh, I think that that is not doing much. It's the wrong way. Yeah, because like they're still aware of the affluence. They're still mm-hmm. they're they're not learning the lesson of hardship. <laughs> they just think that you don't love them, right? Yeah. Because as as a kid, like you know, love is exchanged in a myriad of ways, and for some, it'll be like gift giving and receiving and things of that nature. But uh, when you just take privileges away, I, yeah, I don't think. All right. No, I, I don't think uh, taking things away, but uh, making them work for things is good, right? So, like, maybe have, having it, you know, you want this, okay, we're not just going to give it to you. You go get yourself a side, like, a, you know, an after-school job or something. Well, sort of. Uh, I struggle with that, too, because um, I, think, I think something that's worth uh, making children understand at a young age, especially if they're fortunate enough to be born into affluence and have everything working in their favor. I think it's very important for them to understand the value of time mm-hmm. and how stingy they should be with exchanging it for money. Um, 
but how quickly they should be to exchange it for uh, the greater good. And I think that's like what I'm ultimately arriving at. So I don't think there's anything meaningful about making a kid get a paper route. Yeah. Uh, like going and work at Starbucks. Or yeah. I, I just, I, I truly don't think there are that many lessons born out of that other mm -hmm. than uh, how to better waste time, I guess, yeah. for a little bit of a return. Right. Um, you know, I think like if you're born into privilege, uh, the, the goal should be to be a high performer, not to be adequate, right? And like working these entry-level positions, taking them away from other people who may need them, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of upside to that. But what I do think is very critical is that there are infinite people in need yeah. that uh, are you know, willing to accept help in some capacity. And I didn't really learn this until college uh, in a manufactured way. I mean, obviously just like growing up the way that I did, I think I kind of started to understand it through my own environment, but um, I've, I've always said if I have kids, like one of the routine things that I think I would do would be to volunteer uh, routinely, whether it's, you know, after school, on the weekends, whatever the case may be, but like right. have them exposed to the hardships of life through others. Yeah. Because I think, that's the, I think that's the fastest way to building empathy. Like working at a homeless shelter. Yeah, work at a homeless shelter, mm -hmm. work at a food bank, work, mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean like, I think a lot of parents feel obligated to uh, reduce exposure to the dark side of life. Like never allowing their kids to come in contact with a drug addict, never allowing their kids to come in contact with homeless people, like, right. you know, avert your eyes type of, of, of behavior. If you ignore it, it goes away. Yeah, but I, I feel very strongly about the exact opposite. And again, maybe it's just because I was exposed to all of that at a young age. Right. Um, but I think it's like really critical for empathy's sake, for, um, you know, really being able to just like recognize your plight in life versus others. And also just building uh, more purpose into youth. Uh, at that age, like right. their minds are so malleable, right? And you know, for better or for worse, we were all kind of like fed the American dream mm -hmm. in the sense of like you could be whatever you want to be. But like it was always we're the last generation for that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but it was always it was always with the undertone of capitalism, right? right? Like you can, you can be whatever money. you want to be that will get you rich, right? Right. right? Rather than mm -hmm. you could be you could make an impact on society yeah. however you want. Right. Go to college so you can go out and get a good job. And right. Then get a house and, and live a very successful, uh, sustainable, yeah. I, th yeah. I think seeing um, both sides of the coin is very valuable. Because it just, it builds character. I agree, yeah. Like it just builds who you are. As for me personally, I know my mom used to make me go to my dad. <laughs> just to like live life with him for whatever X amount of time to realize that I had a good life or just like, Kind of like humble me. <clears throat> like but, having the perspective of privilege. Yeah. yeah. Or just like perspective of life, just in general. Like what goes on outside of my four walls. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird because I grew up around a lot of adults that I didn't respect. But um, with enough time spent around them, um, mainly because of who they were to me, whether it was my mother, my stepfather, whatever. Um, you know, I was, I, I just naturally developed empathy for them. Because where respect lacked, and I understood that like I was more adult than they were at a certain age, uh, empathy kind of filled that void because I was at least of the impression of, or at least kind of understood that this doesn't make logical sense, right? Like there shouldn't be scenarios where uh, an adult is needing more care than a kid. So something has to be causing that. Yeah. And generally speaking, like we should care about the things that cause that, whether they're mental illnesses, whether they're a uh, battle against demons like drug and alcohol, whether they're a birth deficiency or, or defect, whatever the case may be, right? You come in contact with all this in life. And it's funny because, you know, growing up, these lessons, they, they kind of get taught to you for normal people anyway, with like a grain of salt, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, kids are so naturally curious, right? Like you're two years old and you see somebody who's handicapped in a wheelchair or whatever, and kids will just blurt out the most random shit. Yeah. And they'll just like point and they'll make a scene and the, the parents, the, the lesson that ends up getting taught there is don't be curious, don't ask questions, avert your eyes. And, uh, you know, eventually you try to, or, or eventually like maybe they get taught into uh, treat them as one in the same, mm -hmm. but that's impossible. Right, because like it's impossible 
at two or three or whatever to not recognize that there's a difference here. And their minds are curious and easily shaped where it's like, if you actually just take the time to explain what, what's going on and like, you know, in a, in a very simple way, of course, like explain to me like I'm in kindergarten type of thing. But like, you know, some people were born differently, like that whole, and I'm not saying that everybody gets this right or wrong, but I just know, like, <laughs> I can think of times where I've seen adults embarrassed by children's behavior that was very uh, not malicious mm -hmm. in intent, right? But, like, you know, they know the undertones of, like, what's happening or whatever the case may be. And I, I don't think it's, I don't think it serves that kid long term. And I also don't think it, like, serves the parents long term. It's like, we should be so much more willing, especially whenever you're lucky enough to be privileged, right? Yeah. If, if you actually have affluence, if you actually have access to travel and all this other stuff, uh, it really is like a fast track to, um, to being able to like build up some level of tolerance and understanding of the world at large without actually having to suffer. Yeah, mm -hmm. especially when you're younger, right? Like you just have more time. You have more time that's not as important, important. in some ways yeah. where like when i was younger um i had some like summer programs and stuff where it was called like future leadership where, like we did a, we did some of these things like go to a food bank uh go to like a shelter like go on like a plane and stuff like learn how things work or whatever but looking back at it now like with that perspective it definitely makes me realize that like when you get older your time can be spent like call it making money like doing something else like and you have more free time when you're younger and like experiencing these things and like having that perspective shift is massive. And like, it's something that makes me realize that I want to kind of do more in that regard. Like I have more, a lot more free time and I'm extremely privileged as I am. Like I can do more when it comes to like volunteering, doing like volunteer work and like something that's more of a perspective to me in the future, like after having the conversation. Yeah. One of the coolest things I did when my, uh, I was a freshman in college is part of, uh, Part of our general studies was that we had to volunteer, I think, like 20 hours or something like that. Oh, really? Um, and <clears throat> I got assigned to work at a retirement home. Okay. And it was actually really cool because... Uh, they just gave you a job or you got to pick? I think we had options, mm -hmm. but if not, it was just assigned to you. Okay. Um, but it was pretty cool because, you know, some of it was like doing some maintenance stuff. Like you would, you would paint and, and do some things like work that they needed done mm -hmm. but the vast majority of it was literally just visiting with people who didn't have families Damn. um yeah it seems like it would be sad but it wasn't it was like no like you made their day kind of honestly it wasn't even like i got that much like yes there was that aspect of it where yeah. uh, you felt good about what you were doing mm -hmm. but it was more so like they were fascinating people to kind of interview right because like yeah they're at end of life and uh you know having no family obviously they're not like really thrilled about uh their situation mm -hmm. but whenever you do give them that attention and you ask them uh you know some amount of questions they're such great storytellers mm -hmm. right like grandparents make the best storytellers yeah. uh my, my grandparents were always this way i used to when i was they a really little kid are. they've had uh, the most experiences yeah so it's like yeah. like every night before bed i didn't ask for like bedtime stories i was at, i would ask my granddad to tell me fishing stories he was an avid fisherman uh, throughout his adulthood. So he'd like tell me about how they would charter boats down in the ocean. Like, you know, I was obsessed with like the idea of marlin fishing and sport fishing and things like that. And he made them sound, uh, now I'm sure, like it was just half bullshit. And I was half, gonna say, mm -hmm. he'd never been marlin fishing before. <laughs> no, he had been, but like, I'm sure the majority of it was he was just like half blacked out and barely remembers the trip. But like, right. he always managed to, to find the details that would just like, it would turn into a riveting story to me. And he could tell them over and over and over again. And I would never get sick of them. He made them good. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's not that hard to entertain a five year old. So it's like, uh, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're way off track here, but. Uh, it's a conversation that I've had a handful of times. Um, there was a there was a point uh, I think it was like a year and a half or two years ago where Chris K was telling me that he wanted to get a job at McDonald's simply because he wanted to be accountable to someone other than himself, and I was like kind of encouraging him to not do that because right. it's it's mindless, right? Like there's a reason why you you aren't pursuing this in life it's because you're you're meant for something better i was like you know volunteer somewhere yeah uh get exposure to people that you don't otherwise have any exposure to in life whatsoever right and we especially in today's day and age like we have such an ability to build an echo chamber 
uh, be it our actual social circle or who we follow in the social media spectrum. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if we're only being exposed to a sliver of society, then sooner than later, you kind of like lose all sort of capacity to have any sort of comprehension or compassion for anybody who doesn't fit that echo chamber, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like if I curate an audience on, on Twitter where I'm only following the most intellectual people who are coming from wealth and affluence, who are highly educated, who are in uh, spaces that I'm interested in, be it tech, fitness, nutrition, poker, whatever, uh, and are mostly male. Like, I just lose the entire scope of the rest of the world, mm -hmm. Yeah. right? Sooner than later. Like, it, it doesn't take that long before eventually now speaking to somebody of average IQ feels like talking to a toddler. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's our nature to gravitate towards the things that interest us most. Right. Uh, and I think, like, we should lean in more so uh, in, into the things that we have disinterest in, I guess. In what way? Because I know what you're talking about, like especially with social media and trying to curate our own feeds for things that we care about. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, how do you, you can't see everything, right? No, of course not. Like, but, how do you expose yourself to things that you just don't care about or don't have the? Well, I think you just recognize things that you're ignorant about uh, day in and day out, mm -hmm. right? It's like I know that I, this is a very simple example, but it's like I know I'm terrible with like uh world politics and uh just overall current affairs uh -huh. of the rest of the world so it well, benefits keep me, me around yeah <laughs> yeah if i want to know about the housewives of uh <laughs> new jersey of uganda there's, there's, there's uh, a different current affair housewives of uganda. <laughs> the the colombian housewives of the cartel they have, they have housewives just, of dubai now of course they do. I, they they should definitely get like Going the, global. They should definitely get like the Colombian cartel housewives. Mm. Now we're uh, talking. That would be uh, definitely a lot of drama. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like I, I could just go out of my way, even if I just followed something as simple as like National Geographic, right? Like even that alone is going to get outside of of my four walls, and that's obviously just a very simple example. But um, I think it's important, like when there are thought leaders in industries that you don't otherwise pay attention to, uh, to expose yourself to that. And for better or for worse, like as much shit as Joe Rogan gets uh, and some of these other podcast hosts, um, and I'm not trying to say that he hasn't curated a bit of an echo chamber, but he does bring in enough outside stuff that I otherwise wouldn't be inter interested in that comes across my desk because of it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's like a guy like Paul Stamets, who is uh, a, a medical is it medical uh, he's some sort of scientist who works almost specifically with fungi right so he's like the mushroom genius and it's like that's not that important for me to know about but it does take me into another realm of looking into the the positive effects of psychedelics of um you know things like psilocybin and, and the medical usages for those and stuff like that and mm -hmm. that's important because the majority of my life i'm incredibly anti-drug and uh kind of treated as black and white where everything is the same where that's you know as you grow older and you get a little bit more exposure you understand yeah. that's not true yeah i guess that's why you tell me to read more right yes <laughs> it's, <laughs> very important. it's the same kind of idea right you just expose the things that are important and you wouldn't be looking at them otherwise unless you actually tried or cared to do it right yeah, I mean, that's kind of the problem is in high school, we're encouraged to read. Kind of. They well, make you read. Well, we have a, we have a pre-decided reading list. Yeah. And we're expected to do reports on it. Mm -hmm. So, like, they turn something into uh, kind of, like, tedious labor. Yeah. Rather than uh, trying to kind of demonstrate more so the, the bigger picture of it all. Yeah, you're right. They really made it feel like shit, dude. Yeah, and it's like, just this podcast alone, look how often we reference, like, that reading list. How many times do we bring up Lord of the Flies? Right, Animal Of Mice Farm. and Men, Animal yeah. Farm. Mm -hmm. You do it to roast me, man. Fuck. Sometimes. <laughs> but, like, you know, these are culturally uh, important references that, you know, again, as technology continues to grow and we, and we keep evolving as a society, those kind of get lost a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the wild thing with that area of literature 
is we're not really seeing it get replaced. It just kind of dies. Right, right? Like, like the classics or whatever. Yeah, because can you think of like much literature that's been written in the last, our lifetime, last 40 years yeah. that has become like must read? I'm sure there's some, yeah, obviously. Of course like, there are. But I'm for sure ignorant right. when it comes to this stuff. And maybe, maybe it's like things like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and stuff like that. Like maybe that is... Oh, Lord of the Rings was written in the 50s. Okay, but but even still, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm just saying, like, relevant to our lifetime. Yeah, Game of Thrones, that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, like, maybe that stuff is what uh, becomes the new To Kill a Mockingbird. Right, mm -hmm. but is it? Is that the right, right idea? Right, that's what I mean, because, like, the beauty of, like, a To Kill a Mockingbird or, um, uh, what was the one about the Salem Witch Trials? The, the Crucible? The Crucible. Crucible. Like, the, the beauty of that stuff is it has a historical reference in time. Even though it's a fictional tale, it takes us back to a time that we have absolutely no other interest in. And, you know, to some degree, history is important. Right. Right. So it's yeah. like, uh, maybe we just need to advance it a couple hundred years and get to like the industrial revolution points now, like have, have some good fiction written about right. the Great Depression and, and things of that nature. It really is like funny that you say that because I remember. Oh, the Scarlet Letter. That's what I was talking uh, about. Thank you, Jason. Go I remember. Uh, like in high school, uh, I did something called the IB diploma. So like you had for English, you had to read a book and like do a seven to 10 minute video, like conversation, but it was recorded. And then they judged you and graded you on like what you talked about in your presentation and stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, just in high school, people kind of were not reading these books and giving these presentations and doing well on them as like a badge of honor. Right. It's like, yeah. I didn't even fucking read that mm -hmm. book. But looking back on it, the person that loses out on not reading the book is you. Yeah. Like you're the one that's not getting the like the information out of it or growing as a person because of it. Because when you're a kid, you just don't want to. You just want to like have fun and do fun things. Yeah. Right. You don't think like that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. That and was literally every teacher's like fucking opening statement to class every fucking school year. I mean, the thing <laughs> is, it's, uh, like, let's be clear though, it is a really tough sell. Like, it is. I, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to go overboard with this. I'm more so speaking to the to the college age, like Landon's age group, way more so than the high school age. Because right like, now that you have the ability to read for on your own time, yeah, right? like nothing's more critical in your in your early adolescence into your teenage years than play, right? Yeah. right? Like almost every major lesson you're going to learn at that time frame is going to be through play, and that's kind of why I'm talking about, uh, you know, having some level of exposure to this outside, like like. To me, reading literature is uh, closer to play when it comes to learning history yeah. than actually sitting through a history class, mm -hmm. right? So you're just trying to find the next thing adjacent that can make things fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and as technology advances, obviously, we'll have like a lot more interaction in that degree. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, man, reading's tough. Like, I, I don't want to start tooting my own horn. I was not a reader. I didn't read a single one of these books that I'm talking about. Not one. <laughs> Literally not one. You were one. one of the guys who just would try to... Uh... I was Get the presentation without reading it. Always, yeah. always. Uh, yeah. I, I can't explain how much I hacked that system, mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm, I'm just a very good listener. Like I learned that way. Uh, I remember, like we did all the Shakespearean plays on audio tape instead of reading them because of the language, mm -hmm. uh, and just you know, vocally, it just it sounds so much better than trying to constantly say like uh, speaking old old English, right. Um, and I, cr I was so much more proficient at, uh, Impressive. the Shakespeare portion of, of like honors English than I was, uh, things like the crucible and a scarlet letter. Like those were just boring tales to me. Yeah. It makes sense because now that I'm out of edu like education, when it comes to school. Like I don't have to do a book report on a book that I want to read. Right? Yeah. So it makes more sense to read them for the play aspect than it is the chore or like labor aspect. Of yeah, and I think that's knowledge. why people try to sell me fiction so much. Like, I'm I'm pretty hard against reading fiction, mm -hmm. uh, just because like I I don't have a ton of time, and like if I'm gonna spend ten hours a week listening to an audiobook or reading or whatever the case may be, I want to learn something new. And I think a lot of people uh, do derive a lot of value from fiction, whether it's uh, getting more creative in their own personal writing because they hear more creative writing styles. Uh, you know, improving upon their vocabulary or even just uh, taking some meaning away from whatever the, the underpinning of the uh, moral of the book is. 
Uh, but for me, like, I can't, I, can't, I, I can't remember the last like good fiction it. book. I tried to get through uh, David Foster Wallace's um, Infinite Jest three different times, and I find the book to be fascinating. Like, yeah. it's a riveting book, but it's so dense, and his language is so complex that I would often just find myself listening to the same chapter over and over and over again and still having lost sight of the plot line. Yeah. right because like he's interweaving like eight nine ten different plot lines at a time and he'll just go like chapters and his chapters are long he'll just go like chapters a at a time without like referencing this pl plot line that he started like you know two or three chapters prior and then immediately like come back to it and it's just like who is this guy again right. <laughs> I, I mean like for me it's just like too much to keep track of but mm -hmm. if you want to start talking about telomeres and uh, you know, reducing inflammation and the amount of sauna time that you can possibly put in to live longer. Like I, I'm just, my ears perk up. Like my <laughs> scientific brain is a lot easier to engage. I think through that. Yeah. That's funny when uh, we went to where well, I stayed at the double tree and they had a little sign, like a warning sign on the sauna. It's like, if you're in here for 30 minutes or more, like you should get out or something. I'm like, is this true? And you just go, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> nah, they fucking lying. That's, that's just to cover their ass, man. Yeah, that's exactly. basically their insurance policy. Yeah. Uh, well, this took a, a deep intro turn yeah, that I wasn't just, expecting. Um, we should wasn't on, it wasn't in pre-production. Honestly, like this conversation is very adjacent to the one that I want to talk about with poker, but uh, I do want to fill in a little bit of uh, in-between stuff with some fun things that have occurred over the last 24 hours. So uh, first thing is uh, <laughs> I just came across this tweet, and all it says is, what type of training is this? And it's a woman <laughs> getting beheaded. Not well, literally, not, beheaded, not but. literally, uh, but you know, basically. What in the fuck just happened? I, I watched it at least 10 times. Yeah, same. Yeah. Um, because I knew she wasn't getting hit in the face. That was the only thing that I knew. Yeah. Was that she's not getting hit well, in the you face. You can see the cord behind her. So she runs and then once the cord you know, yeah. and it just jerks her so back. So I eventually, I eventually started reading the comments to figure out what the hell this video was. And it's, <laughs> it's stunt, stunt double training. Yeah. 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 So what happens <laughs> is the cord is the exact length of where the, uh, the staff ends. Right. Mm -hmm. So he just gets to take a full whack, never come close to it. And also right. the camera angle, like it, it's a bit of an illusion. So mm -hmm. I think they, I think somewhere in the thread, they showed it from another angle, and he's actually like a good six to ten inches away from her face. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole uh, the whole bit was uh, fake getting knocked out, <laughs> which I gotta tell you, just even getting jerked back by that cord, right? <laughs> that that can't feel good. No, man. Yeah. What are these? On it? <laughs> this is crazy. There's another show. On, I, I get down the rabbit hole in Netflix. There's a show on Netflix where um, it's this dad and his two twin daughters. He has three daughters actually. But his two twin daughters uh, are training to be... He's a stunt. He's a stunt man. Um, like, he had done stunts for, like, Fast and the Furious. So it's all car-based. Oh, this, is, this isn't fiction. This is real. No, this is real. So <laughs> it's, it's all car-based. So he does, like, a bunch of stunts uh, in movies and commercials in a car. And his two twin daughters are now stunt women. And, man, it's wild to see some of the shit that they do. Like, it's just so out there. Yeah. And uh, it's become a very guilty pleasure of mine. To just like watch it because it's also so over dramatic, right? Like, so the car will like drive through a pane of glass, you know, and then just come to a screeching halt, and that's the stunt. And the probability of getting hurt is probably like one percent. Yeah. But every time that it happens, uh, like if it's the daughters driving through, the dad's like on set watching. Where's my daughters? Where are they? <laughs> And if it's him driving through, they yeah. just like cut to the cut to the daughters, and they have this like panicked look on their face, like this is the one time that the mm -hmm. car explodes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, stunt stunt double training seems seems out there, and I imagine the pay is not as good as the risk. Definitely not. Probably not. I mean, they're not getting paid movie star salary, that's yeah. for sure. Um, moving into football a little bit. Uh, so, <laughs> two things. One, poker needs this desperately. Uh, I don't know how we get it, but we need it. We need this like behind the scenes, mic'd up type of uh, shit that goes on. Even if it's just like breaks on tournaments, right? Like just mic up a bunch of dudes what? on break and, you know, uh, 
as the producer like sign a contract that says like don't worry we won't we won't embarrass you in any way shape or form like right, you, right. you can have final cut something along those lines yeah, like, but like we just need these conversations so this past sunday um i'm always gonna butcher the name but butter the kicker for the chiefs buddha baker no no <laughs> It's it's like oh Harrison Butker Butker yeah, yeah, Butker. yeah Butker. Oh. okay so he gets hurt and their emergency kicker is uh is their safety Justin Reed who's just a beast to begin with right so uh <laughs> we we have like a two minute video of him going up to the coach going like I'm in and he's like yeah and they just like roll with the whole bit. Butker's kick is away. He falls down as he kicks it. That's smart. Too much going on. Yeah, stay ready, kick it. Butker, he just under his ankle. I bet. Heads up. You know, that, that backup plan may have to come to fruition with Justin Reed. So, you need me to do kickoff, too? Yeah. Bet. You kick off, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're just sending it out the end zone. Huh? We're just sending yeah. out the end zone. Yeah, kick it. You know Bunker running? Yeah, I, okay. I know he's out. Hey, you guys get some. Yeah, hey, you want to get some of that net right? Yeah. He was a kicker in high school and a former soccer player as well. He was the emergency kicker during his days in Stanford. Cool. I like it. Good. Let's get it. Hey, we got to get our hands shaped down. All right, what are we doing? For, are we going for that? Yeah. We're going to go. Let's boom, boom, boom. boom. I bet. They shovel it inside, Edward Delaire, touchdown, Kansas City. Two drives, two touchdowns. Now Justin Reed will try the point after. But he's never really been able to put uh, his skills to use in the NFL in a game except in a preseason game. Down, down. In the preseason, he was having some fun, and he nails the PAT. Boom. And Justin Reed's kick goes beyond the end zone. Is that Jan Stenerud? Who's wearing number 20? <laughs> <laughs> he kicked that thing through the uprights. He kicked it. That's Wait, amazing. So, so Bucker's not actually hurt? No, he is hurt. Oh, he yeah. is hurt. He hurt his ankle. Yeah. Uh, how much of a nerd is Mahomes? <laughs> oh, my a God. Dave Reed's kicking. He kicked me from the uprights. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, don't do Mahomes like that. What the wow. fuck, man? He's just like the best athlete in the world, and he's <laughs> such a dork. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear him talk other places. <laughs> oh, man. man. Uh, I I love it. Like that whole that whole two minute bit is just so good, and it's so low effort for the NFL because they obviously have a full production crew yeah. every single game. Um, but we kind of do too, right? Like at this Triton stop, it's fifty guys, maybe you know a hundred, like we saw in the two hundred k or whatever. But mm -hmm. like you know who the guys are, like you, you you get it, like you you know what you know what should happen. This is uh, fitting for today's show, Sam Grafton. Should be mic'd up everywhere. Yeah. Every fucking tournament cash. And anything that man does, put a goddamn mic on him. Put a mic yeah. on him. He is the best. Put a mic on him. Like, I, I mean, the thing is, is, you would like to have some footage, obviously. Like, that, that video isn't the video without the footage, of course. But, you know, we can play it over top of him actually at the table, whatever. I just need, I need Sam Grafton. Walking down the hall <laughs> of Bally's Paris, saying hi to everybody within eyesight or, or eyeshot, and saying it at a volume that allows anybody who is anywhere within the space to know that he's now in the building. <laughs> he is a man who just captures a room, uh, both through his presence and... <laughs> Man. And his enthusiasm, if you will, like yeah, he's the guy I want to hear mic'd up. He's he's just so good too. Like uh, for those of you who like haven't had the pleasure of getting to know Sam, don't worry, he's super approachable. So if you play this game, just say hi to him, and you'll, <laughs> you'll very quickly become friends. Uh, but like he he's the guy that just knows everything about everyone, right? It's like 
he walks through the hall and he comes up on a group of euros and suddenly he's just talking about like some Sunday major score that one of them had seven and a half years ago. <laughs> and then three seconds later he pivots and he's talking to like some OG Americans about the old hundred rebuy on stars and the WPT <laughs> that they shipped three years ago. And it's just like, how are you so in the mix, bro? The over-under on the amount of mates you will hear from Sam Grafton <laughs> yeah. got to be over 20 in the It, it really span. is. He's such a joy to be around, man. And like, if, if I could find a mic'd up, uh, uh, he's, he's my number one pick to click for, for mic'd up. Mm -hmm. we, we went deep in the 10K6 Max together, uh, not this past World Series, but the, the fall one. And for as high pressure of a scenario as it was, having him around suddenly just like, alleviated that and i don't know why because he's a fierce competitor yeah, he's right? good at poker he's, yeah he's very good at poker and like good. he cares when he's at the table but he has this ability to kind of take the edge off yeah both for his own benefit as well as like anybody else who's like at that level of comfort with the game i think yeah, yeah it makes you feel just, comfortable in his presence he just makes it fun yeah. he's just he's very good at that there's a couple people that like i think i would love to hear mic up keith lear is another one Mm, we might have to mute that one. <laughs> Keith, yeah, he would be Keith, fucking Keith's great. getting some shady shit, man. I don't like, give a fuck. He would be great. Keith, Keith has like 10 bookies on speed dial. He has, he's, he's picking up a dime bag to go man. hook up with a hooker on break. I mean, it's just like, you know, Keith's out there in the mix. He would be fucking amazing. He, he would be fun. Who else? Hmm. Uh, there's got to be some some more mic'd up people that are point the is we have characters yeah and we have access to doing this kind of stuff yeah it takes a little bit more effort but um like i think this is what poker news of the past was very good at way back in the early jason mercier days can't right? get the behind the scenes yeah view like, of what's going on yeah, it was a little bit manufactured because it was always like, hey, on this next break, do you mind if I steal five minutes of your time yeah. type of stuff? Yeah. So it was a little bit less uh, authentic of like, hey, Sam, we're just going to mic you up today. And like, we're going to follow you around. This, this <laughs> teenage uh, intern is going to follow you when around. When we first met Danielle, she was, wasn't she like following Mercer, Mercer around for the, for like the day or something? She was There's a part, part of, of that? Poker News. Yeah. I feel like she wasn't one of the, in front of the camera girls though that was she wasn't in front of the but i think she was like doing some some yeah maybe it, it was it was mainly christy arnett at that point mm -hmm. uh so it was like christy sarah herring um i'm trying to think like who else was a part of that maybe uh yeah i can't really remember that was that was a while ago i remember christy was the the biggest um up-and-comer at that point but they used to do like a day in the life of yeah the said player yeah yeah, yeah. And it was like it was great because you would just you wouldn't just see them at the table playing. You would get to see like how they prepared for it, what they did on breaks. What, I mean, the biggest thing that's becoming clear to me was. is that seeing them play at the table is the most meaningless part. Right. It's yeah. the driest footage. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually the most boring thing of all time. You yeah, just look it's, at someone and they sit there and they push It's just up. so impossible to capture them at a meaningful moment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And even if you do, you don't have whole cards. No. Right. So it's like, I think the WPT has done a pretty great job of this where they just have like these roving cameras during their events and they shoot like almost uh, like dirty, like gorilla style where they're, they're kind of like uh, at the, the, the edge of the table underneath the player eight's armpit shooting player two type of thing. <laughs> um, but it comes out like really cool. And <laughs> the, the main idea behind it is that if they capture enough of this B-roll, some of these people will run deep and it will become meaningful to the story later. Right, yeah. What's lacking, though, is that audio, right? Mm. Uh, and I think, like, WSOP lends an even bigger opportunity there because it's a festival. It's, it's 30, 40, 50 days in a row yeah. where you have all this opportunity. Honestly, like, I, I don't think I'm stepping out on a limb to say that the most interesting aspect of the WSOP outside of just figuring out who each day's winner is is what's happening on breaks, Right, like that's where you're getting all of the character development, and you're getting to learn uh, about the clicks. You're getting to learn about like the objectives of why people are there, who they are as people, like their personalities, their characters, and all that other stuff. It's like, yeah, nobody knows much about Sam from playing with him. I, I've known Sam for the better part of a decade, maybe the better part of two, and I think that 10K6 Max was one of the first times we had ever played together. 
like <laughs> live, mm -hmm. right? So it's like uh, we've had conversations. We've sat down for coffee. We we have this mutual uh, uh, like timeline that, that we've played under, but we don't know each other as poker players. Not not at least intimately, right? We know from afar. Like uh, I see what he does from afar, and I'm sure like he is in the past. Like see what I've done from afar. I couldn't make any judgment on Sam's game at yeah. all, other than like I think he's probably pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like if that's what he, if that's the the case for his peers, then why the hell would the general audience give a shit? Yeah. Some yeah, of the, some of the best scenes from Dead Money was when you were on break and we were like talking. You were going through your thought process and yeah, and what was happening. It because like at the moment when you're watching the actual play yeah, you can't say we anything don't, yeah we don't know what's going on in your head and what what you're thinking and what your strategy is but then when you, you go on break and you're like okay well this was the situation and here's what was going on that's a lot more interesting i think it, uh, puts, it puts the thought of what you're doing to the gameplay right I, another person who had been great to mic up is tony j somebody somebody said it mm. um but who we do not want mic'd up and who we do not want this to fall into nobody fucking put a microphone near Kasuf, or whatever the <laughs> fuck his name is. That's funny. The most talkative people uh, are the ones that I want to hear from the least. Like, I never want to I don't hear want Kasuf to be mic'd. I don't want Helmuth to be mic'd. I don't want Alex Keating to be mic'd. I don't want... Uh, nobody else really jumps out. Like Jamie Gold, if we're going way back. Yeah. Like, I don't want to hear those guys, because it, it's just... They it's, do enough talking at the table. It's also just vapid. Need, yeah. Right? It's, right. It's literally just filling the void. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, it's, um, maybe it's just the name Sam, but Sam Grizzle, I think, would have oh, been. Oh, yeah, the Grizzle. My yes. dude. R.I.P. R.I.P. Rest yeah. in peace, homie. He Man. was like the original poker troll. Mm -hmm. He was. He, was. Well, he punched Helmuth in the face. <laughs> 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 he, he didn't just talk about it. He beat about yeah, it. Yeah, like, he... he he was about that life, Guapo. Yeah, like, he Grizzle told him he was, was going to smack him in the mouth, and he fucking did. He was mm -hmm. really about that life, man. We yeah. were playing some. We were playing fucking, I think, 1-2 or 2-5 at Red Rock, me and Corey, like maybe two years ago. And Sam just rolls up at like midnight, and we play at like 9 o'clock in the morning. He's just telling stories, having a great fucking time and a blast. Man, that guy was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was definitely a fun guy. Um, I think that... Uh, yeah, I think some of the old school guys are, or would have have fit this narrative well. Yeah. I think it's probably less so true now. Baja well, mm. probably would have been good back then, not, yeah, now. not now. And the reason why I'm saying not now is because like when you're broke, you're not interested. Yeah. Like you're just not. I mean, you're miserable. Like I'll mm -hmm. tell you what the breaks look like. Yeah. You're lamenting every fucking pot you lost. Yep. You're worried that you're not gonna be able to feed your kids. Like. Yeah, it's poker is just a game. Like. If you're looking at like the NFL, like mic'd up stuff, and there'll be plays going on, and they'll literally zoom in on the guy that's mic'd up, and he'll just like be like saying shit, literally mm -hmm. saying anything. In poker, you can't have that, right? Because you don't have the access to the whole cards, plus being mic'd up and talking about it in the moment. Which is why, like on breaks, it's so much nicer. Like Brian's saying, all these footages are better because you can actually get into talking about stuff that's important. Yeah, at the it, table, you can't say shit. Right, it just varies. It's like, you know, you get some strategy from certain groups. You yeah. get some jokes from others. Like, yeah. it, it's, it's a real window into what the game looks like. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, like, we often try to create projects, especially around the World Series, that try to illuminate this. Yeah. But the problem is we can't really do it... Um, we, we can't really do it at a, a grand enough scale, right? So, like, when ACR does the punter's pad, mm -hmm. it's just the ACR pros. Yeah, yeah. And now the only people that care are the audience that are already watching the ACR yeah, pros. Yeah, like the ACR fan base. Right. And it was the same thing when we did it with results may vary. It's right. like we weren't going to get much attention outside of people who already followed Salt for Why. Right. I think you really need to find uh, an objective third party that only just cares about poker in general, right? like a Poker Go or a WSOP or Poker News or whatever. And they're just literally trying to find, you know, those that are willing and those that are names. Everything ranging from vloggers to high stakes, high rollers right. to cash guys to MTT grinders to, yeah. you know, whatever. Like you, you, you could just, you just fire a bunch of shit against the wall and see what kind of content you land. Right. On. Like it seems like when it comes to who best suited for these things, it seems like it's the tournament operators like wpt like poker go it makes more sense for them to do like a mic'd up version kind of thing than one-off like individual brands or 
Uh, Stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, well, it's it's very different. WSOP and WPT are very, very different. WPT is a yeah, like licensed, yeah, yeah. It's a licensed brand to a casino, mm -hmm. where WSOP is actually a, a festival in and of itself, right? Right. So the the operations of WSOP fall under the WSOP umbrella. Yeah. Where WPT is just like they have a staff that goes to your local casino, and then they have its a, a side TV deal. Yeah. So it would be more like Poker Go. Uh, when it comes to WSOP, it, because Poker Go, Poker, even, Poker Go even, is the production of WSOP. I didn't even mean WSOP in general. I just meant like those things, like Poker Go or WPT type, seem like the yeah. better, <laughs> better suited for it. Where they, like they just put stuff on their YouTube channel or whatever, and like they have the mic up segments and stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. little bits versus you like Salt for Y trying to do it or ACR trying to do it or whatever. Yeah, the it's just less outreach overall. Correct. The the incentives just don't align yeah. at the small uh at the small level. Speaking of Sam, huge congratulations to him as he did win the Triton 200k for 5.5 million. Motherfucker won. Congratulations. Ring a ding ding baby, let's go. Best in the world. Best in the world. Legit OG, been around as long as I can remember. Squid Poker, the one and only. Um beat a goat heads up, Linus Love coming in second i didn't get to see the heads up match but i saw in our chat yesterday everybody was saying linus kept making sets heads up which was he very hard to do and not the right kind of guy that you want to be playing against when right. you make sets because he won't just have sets right he will mostly never have a set right the good news is i think squid had a big enough uh lead to begin with that he was still able to overcome ah. uh largest career score for sam obviously that goes well without saying um I, and I think that this is going to carry us into the bigger conversation that I wanted to have. Sam's no spring chicken. He is, uh, he is not a young gun. He's a winter chicken. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. He's just older. Uh, he's, yeah. means, <laughs> Went through a few seasons. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Um, but yeah, he's no young man. Uh, this is not his first rodeo. He's been on the high... He's a little bit newer to the high roller scene, I would say. Maybe the last since covid ish uh started playing a little bit bigger but uh he became a stars ambassador probably around the same time right like 2020 ish i would guess maybe 2019 yeah, i think a little before that. yeah somewhere in somewhere in that neighborhood um long time coming in my opinion He's always represented himself in the game incredibly um incredibly well and i think stars recognized that with him yeah uh so it was very happy to see that happen um, and I think at that point, like, if you had to ask most people, like, you know, has Sam made it? I would think that they would qualify that as kind of like the pinnacle of his career, like a forever grinder who had been, who had pretty much done everything that you can do in the online streets, uh, made a good living and got rewarded with a, a very good brand ambassadorship. I don't think that we necessarily saw this, uh, this high roller path um out for him because like you know coming from my vantage point is somebody who's 40 and granted i've played cash my whole life like mtts haven't been my pursuit but mm -hmm. the idea of uh shifting gears and doing all the things that it would take to not only be competitive in the high roller arena but also to be able to sustain uh the ability to play those high rollers like that that requires a lot of liquidity right so uh, even just like finding proper partnerships, being able to properly sell and all those other things, it's daunting. And it's a young man's game, you know, between the study and the the travel and the, uh, the, the alignment of the amount of investing that it takes and all these other things. It's a lot of hurdles to jump through. So mm -hmm. I think when I heard that Sam had thrown his hat in the ring for high rollers, I was kind of just like, wow, like respect, like, hey, that Star's deal must be way fucking better than i thought he got uh, invited as a businessman right no <laughs> no businessman uh, Grafton. maybe now the wow. funny part is i don't know who invited him yeah me neither. I, I still don't think any of us found out we can figure it out I, th I think honestly he's gregarious enough that he just he's is that guy who in. invited himself to the party <laughs> <laughs> Like, yeah, that'd be fucking oh, what up, guys? I'm here. It it just just, shows uh, up. 
There's 90 entrants, and then they make 91 entrants for Sam Grafton. Right, there's yeah. just like a meeting of the minds amongst like the, the upper the upper tier. Like, yeah, the voting system. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? He's an OG. He's here. He wants to play. We just got to let him play. Like, who's going to tell Sam he can't like, play? Who's going to tell him he can't fucking play it? Like, right. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is a good, uh, th this is a very impressive character arc for him. Obviously, he's worked incredibly hard. His game has sharpened a ton. He's competing at the highest level. Now winning uh, one of the biggest prizes out there against elite competition so massive massive uh congratulations to sam and where that wants where, where that steers the conversation for me is um it correlates to this tweet that garrett put out today uh that says uh dave ramsey was asked what it takes to build a business and he's quoted as saying perseverance through an amazing amount of <laughs> perseverance through an amazing amount of manure Perse perseverance through pain that breaks your heart and then Garrett replies and says, many think I just show up and win. They don't see the countless sleepless nights in pain. There's no free lunch in poker. Uh, and the reason why I think that this is relevant is not even necessarily because uh, I think Garrett does or does not struggle that much with these things. Uh, not even necessarily because I think that people are or are not aware that it's fucking hard to get to the highest ranks. But it's so much more than what you see now, right? Like on the surface to somebody who's not very aware of poker's history, you look at Sam Grafton shipping a high roller and you just say, this guy's good at poker. He's been around for a while and like, this is no shock. It's a long fucking journey, mm -hmm. yeah. right? A long, painful, persevered journey that doesn't just happen for anybody who's not willing to suffer a yeah. lot. And I think that that's Garrett's ultimate point, even if, you know, he is uh, kind of stating it from a place of he feels this way, right? Because I'm sure it does apply to him. As a matter of fact, I know it does. Like, as somebody else who's kind of in the arena, like, there's more, ple or there's more pain than pleasure. The, the lows are way lower than the highs can ever be. Uh, and on top of that, there's so much fucking uncertainty. Even when you're just put into the most gifted opportunities imaginable, there are still so many outlier effects that take place, be it funding or having a seat or the ability to play or the ability to play well. Like all of these things are impossible to just have pure alignment with all the time. And I think that's what he's speaking to when he says, it looks easy to you. It looks easy to you, the viewer, yeah. when I just show up, cover the table, flop a bunch of sets and break everybody, right? Mm. <laughs> and from Sam's point of view, it's like, yeah, it looks easy to you. Like for three days... I got dealt good cards. I played my best. Uh, I outmaneuvered the competition and I walked away with one of the biggest prizes that will be awarded this year. Yep. So to all of you, that looks easy. And the result is, in fact, largely going to be a byproduct of variance, right? That, those individual results. Especially for tournaments. Right. But what this message is kind of speaking to, and you know, Sam didn't say it, but I, I surely imagine that he feels it, is this is the payoff for all the pain and suffering that I've put in for so, so long, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't think people understand how rare and how elite these high stakes players are at what they do and how much sacrifice it took to get there. Even, yeah. as, and maybe even especially for the youngest of the group, right? Because a lot of the young ones that are in the arena, actually, maybe I shouldn't say especially for, because obviously it's crazy if you've been playing for 20 years and you're still at this level. Uh, the amount of like perseverance there and uh, ability to continually reinvent yourself is just worth your weight in gold. Right. But for the young ones, they have to overcome so much. Like, they have no access to liquidity. So either they had to win a whole fucking bunch of money to get a nest egg that they could potentially like sell to an investor, or they had to get so good through countless hours of study that they could prove to uh, a, an investor that they're worth the buy. Right. Right? Nobody just wakes up with millions of dollars. Like, uh, I think that there's this uh, misunderstanding amongst the general populace that when somebody under the age of 25 is playing nosebleeds cash or high stakes tournaments, that they are trust fund babies. And I got to tell you, in my 20 years, I've never met one. You met one? <laughs> Who? John Perry? No. No? Why do you... Who? What trust fund? His dad's Ralph Perry. Uh, His dad true. is a professional grinder. <laughs> like what fucking trust fund? But he just didn't he just start playing high stakes at very young? 
No, he won fucking uh, WPT. He, he won a WPT in Florida and got second in five diamond. He had two seven figure scores like within less than twelve months of one another. That'll do it. It's like, yeah, it. you find a way to fire off. And he's young, so like he just put it all at risk, and he was also probably able to leverage those scores into backing or some sort of investing. Yeah, and even for like uh, a friend of ours, like Espen, like Espen's been playing poker since two thousand fucking four. Yeah, two thousand four. Mm-hmm. As long as I have, like he's been playing. That's a fucking long time. Yeah. Almost twenty years. Yeah. And, like, someone tells you, hey, 20 years down the line, if you start playing poker, you're going to win the main for 10 million or whatever, or 5.5 after, like, you swap or whatever. Like, doesn't really, not the point. The point is you have to get there, like, 20 years later and mm-hmm. be like, you know what? This is still what I want to do, and this is still the process I want to take. Because you could even make the argument, which is probably just true, that the best player in the overall tournament, in each instance of a tournament, might not actually win it right right just variance is just so real you know like the best player could have been out first like they won yeah they too like can't can't re-enter or whatever like it's just entice no not me i didn't play a tournament you got (laughs) but you just have to keep fucking showing up and like people forget there's a lot of value in just showing up every day and actually putting in volume and especially for tournaments because you never know what's going to come in you just have hope a lot of hopium in tournaments a lot Mm -hmm. of hopium and yeah, that's kind of the craziest thing, right? Like, Espen wins the main event for, for $10 million, right? Uh, and let's assume he had all of himself. Sure, yeah. Even, even if he did, over a 20-year career, now that just averages out to a 500K win rate per year, right? Mm-hmm. Which it's is nice. Bad. No, it's not <laughs> it's bad. It's not too bad. It's not too bad, but like when people think of professional poker players, especially ones playing at the highest stakes, they don't think that they're making uh, an advanced lawyer's salary. Yeah. Right. They don't think that they're making uh, something along the lines of a CEO of a very small startup. I mean, I don't know. I mean, what what do you really? I, I mean, think people think of poker players similar to athletes. Really? Yeah. I think that they Especially think. If they I don't think know they poker. think. Maybe I just I'm too inside. You know to poker. Know. Yeah, yeah. Because like that's not how I would perceive it. I would perceive it as yeah, like no. I would think the maj- majority of good like professional poker players make like low six figures that's because you've talking, been one yeah, yeah. We're talking, you also know right. not to tip on the main event right. but like the general <laughs> populace is going to leave a 100k no, right, tip right and they think that th- this is akin to being like a baseball manager mm-hmm. right. right and also most of the general populace will think of poker players <laughs> as like the elite like oh d-nags go homie people yeah. just have Eight figure plus net yeah. worth. Like, right. oh, of course yeah. you make a bunch of money. You're a poker player. Mm-hmm. Do you know how often I get ridiculed and scorned for being open about the fact that I was backed when I was playing 300, 600, 1200? <laughs> Do you know how many of those same people think Phil Ivey's been playing on his own dime his entire career? Yeah. yeah it's right. laughable. Right. Right? Like, this guy hasn't played on his own dime for the better part of a decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Of course it would not. Be, it would be stupid business right. for him to have some amount of money. I mean, he literally plays the biggest fucking games in the world. Like, mm-hmm. games we can't even fathom. You know, these games in Macau that are potentially as large as, like, 2K, 4K. Mm-hmm. You need tens, tens if not of hundreds dollars. of millions of dollars to be in that arena. There's tens of millions of dollars on the table. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, does he have all of himself? Of course fucking not. Right. And that's the thing. The general public, is they, they, they are just willfully ignorant to that. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. Right? Like, it's, it's not that big of a deal, but... Then what ultimately happens is any truths that get leaked turn into scandals or negativity or whatever the case yeah. may be. And it's a huge byproduct of us just doing such a poor job of, of kind of like educating the market and, and uh, selling our industry for what it is. I mean, you see it all the time when people win a tournament. People ask, how much did you have of yourself? Like, it doesn't fucking matter. Right. It just doesn't matter. Like, mm-hmm. what matters is the skill set. What matters yeah, is how good you that's are. that's not how the human mind works. No. Right. So it's well, that's why like, the general populace yeah. thinks that everyone that's a pro poker player makes infinite. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, it's just more so if they see them on TV. Right. They see them on TV. They see that they have this. Like, people will look at, if they don't know anything, and they'll look at your total tournaments, like, cash. Right. They'll see a and hand And they in think mom. that's, like... You have that money in your bank account. Yeah, nobody right? has the amount of money. It's like, in oh, Berkey has you know five million in tournament scores, so he just has that sitting laying around somewhere. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. If only if, were, if you find it, let me know. That, that <laughs> is that is kind of the crazy thing about uh, uh, about being an avid watcher of sports, poker, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Um, 
basically people who are working a nine to five and getting, you know, X amount of dollars for their service, whether that's, you know, anywhere from minimum wage all the way to making like low to mid six figures. Uh, I think the vast majority of them think that the only thing preventing them from saving every penny is the fact that they only make their uh, living wage times some amount, right? Times 0.5 or times one or times two, whatever, right? Like they only have so much excess money. Mm -hmm. So it's impossible to save. But I think they see industries like ours where there are so many like windfall events or what appear to be windfall events, right? It's like I went a half a million over two days uh, playing high stakes poker and they're just like oh so like you're just giga rich now like right, yeah. that just all goes right to your pocket it's like mm-hmm. well no i sold half of myself and right. i've been on a 200k <laughs> downswing right. the other half goes to taxes <laughs> right. like, and then yeah part of it goes to taxes right. and it's like when it was all said and done mm-hmm. i needed i netted like 10k right <laughs> <laughs> right and it's just like uh, and it's not because i'm an idiot got your main event buy-in though you're good right it's like <laughs> it's it's not because you're an idiot it's not because you're bad with money or anything along mm-hmm. those lines it's because it's business that's right you know it, it, you're just watching the the money flow aspect happen in real time right, right. exactly right like, like if, if you just like if you looked at it like a, a business and how much a business spends mm-hmm. right and you're like wow okay the, or, or how much their, their revenue is right right you just look at their revenue and nothing else you're like this company's just killing it but then you, and then you look at the overhead and how much their expenses right. are you're like okay well it's uh you know less than a you lot thought of that. Yeah, yeah yeah if yeah. instead of watching a poker game you watched a ticker of like an, an amount of products sold for right. x amount of dollars yeah and you just watch that for like six hours and mm-hmm. you're like holy shit right dude wipes just made x amount of dollars <laughs> over six hours that's insane yeah and then afterwards they said and here's our expenses right right for this yeah. month here's right payroll here's all everything that goes into it right you wouldn't yeah. just suddenly be like wow this company is inept yeah. they're so yeah. stupid they're spending money like <laughs> it's like of course yeah. the the money earned doesn't go directly into your right. pocket you're always only going mm-hmm. to be worth a fraction of what you accumulate right uh and you know, I, 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 I speak about this stuff out loud because I do think it's important to normalize the industry, mm-hmm. right? I think when we glorify the industry as uh, just a pure gambling industry, mm-hmm. then this sentiment that, that Garrett There's, puts yeah. out kind of does uh, get lost on everybody, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important. Like, I'm glad that he spoke out about this because I do think it's really important. We don't have any media uh, and I remember that there was a time when uh, Jason Kuhn was very outspoken about this kind of stuff too. Uh, you know, kind of having a little bit of a chip on his shoulder for like how fucking hard he worked and how little appreciation there is for it, right? Yeah. Because it's just like, you're either nobody or you made it. Mm-hmm. And like, once you make it, they forget that you were once nobody. Right. And they just have this high expectation that like, you're just going to show up and perform every single day and that it's effortless to you. It's like, we're humans. We, we all go through it. Yeah. And you don't always make it. So a lot of us that you're seeing and, yeah. uh, you know, giving any sort of like uh, credentials or, or credence to, we're the survivors, yeah. right? Like, yeah, we worked really fucking hard, but we have a lot of survivorship bias too. Mm. It didn't have to be us. Yeah. Like the yeah. reason why it looks so simple is because you've worked so hard in the past. Right. You know? Right. And like, it, that just goes up, like falls upon deaf ears and looks, oh, like he just knows what he's doing. He's so good. It's like, well, how do you think he got so good? Right. And then the counter to that is everybody who thinks that like they could just step right into their shoes and do the exact same thing if it, if it were just the money factor. Right. Like, oh, if somebody gave me a half a million dollars, I'd sit on Hustler and cover everybody and just win every day too. It's like, yeah. you wouldn't though. You wouldn't because you don't have that 19 years of experience mm-hmm. of, of suffering and going through the pain and the, the discipline necessary to actually be in an opportune situation to excel, right? And I, I think that these conversations are important because, again, like we don't have any sort of like outlets that, that build these characters, right? We, we oftentimes just get to know them in retrospect. Right. Like once they are somebody, right. then we get to hear about what allowed them to get there. And yeah. all you're listening to at that point is survivorship bias. Right. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, you might not even care about that stuff. You just make up your own opinions as to how they got there. Like, oh, he got yeah. lucky he did this. Oh, he did this. Well, that's what that. happens with all the Euros. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because like we don't know them at all. Right? They're, they're just, they're all mysteries to us. And there's just like allure and legend Mm-hmm. Uh, like the Linus, yeah, like like, like Lion, or even even a better example would be like OTB Red Baron. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Like 
he he's basically the Loch Ness monster. Or like a Barry Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. It's like these guys we literally know absolutely fucking nothing about them. Yeah, yeah. Right? Except for like the the uh the lore that is kind of created on the internet. Right. Like they just play everybody, they beat everybody. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's like one of two things will happen. Like somewhere down the line we'll just find out that they're all cheating or that they were literally the goats. Yeah. yeah. And when that finally comes out, if it's the latter where they were literally the goats, now we have to recreate their entire path yeah. and explain to everybody why we should care. Or there's an anon- like they they might just like stay anonymous, right? Like there's no Well, if they to- stay anonymous, uh, not that it leans it one way or the other, but they just disappear. Yeah. Right? They just disappear like th- some people want that they just want to play poker like especially with online like have their screen name do their things get the money move on well, well yeah. the moving on part is the bigger point right so it, it really just means that whether they did it nefariously or cleanly we'll never know. their whole goal is to just have some amount of success in money won in order to move on to something that they deem to be more uh worthy of their time I yeah guess. gullible maybe yeah like working in a homeless shelter probably not <laughs> Probably, probably more so like, you know, figure out a way to convert PO Solver into a war game device. Mm-hmm. Mm. Connor, are you okay over there? I'm good. <laughs> I gotta make late red, so you know, I'll just packing up my shit. <laughs> <laughs> soon as soon as we go off the air, he's bolting. What are you? Getting what home. are you late regging, Connie? Uh, dusty. Just wanted to play something. What Dusty. dusty? Uh, Orleans. As well, oh, them. right. Yeah, the old Orleans $40 buy and $40 rebuy. Wait, what is it? Should I come down with you and play? Come on. Let's go. Man. Let's end this bitch and run out there. Yo, I got some $20 play. tournaments oh, online wait, to wait, win. Wait, wait, wait. We only get like 12 big blinds. Oh, that's... That, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Too I'm, deep? Too deep for Bowen? <laughs> way too deep. If he doubles, he has 24. That becomes a problem. <laughs> There's a double-edged sword here sometimes. Uh, yeah. Seems like a lot. <laughs> Um, I enjoyed this conversation. I mm-hmm. hope you guys did as well. Uh, I think we're gonna wrap. Oh, actually, breaking news! Oh. I literally, I literally <laughs> just got this. This is an MBA. This is a Matt Berkey announcement. Yeah, wow. I, ju- I just got an ESPN announcement on my phone. I happened to look down at the at the last time the camera wasn't on me, and I almost forgot about it again. TJ Watt does not need surgery. Thank Christ! You heard it here first. That's right. This is uh, there is a god. This is, this is a solve for why breaking news. He has been informed that he won't need surgery. He, he could potentially be back as early as six weeks. So from uh, what I understand, whoa. he's going to attempt to rehab it first. Mm-hmm. Um, see what ends up happening. So it seems like it's Listen, just a partial he's tear. He's a man. He'll be back in three weeks. It's possible. Uh, he, did, he did put out a tweet. Uh, it's just Arnold Schwarzenegger saying, <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> That's a good one. So uh, all is not lost in... I, I got to tell you, I'm way more hopeful than I should be. The Patriots looked like fucking trash week one. Mm-hmm. And I was already counting that as a loss on the schedule. I uh, hope Roger Stevenson does some well. Does some because he's on my team. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you so much. I hate. They don't have to win. He can just you know. I hate these conversations. Eli got hurt. Eli Mitchell got hurt. Now I need my my backup in there. I'm I'm struggling. I loathe. I loathe that at any point in time you're watching a Steeler game. Never. And finding some sort Never. of console. Steelers always Yo, come first. Did you know Pittsburgh is a fucking dog in this game at home? Against the Pats? Against the Pats, they're minus or uh, plus one and a half. Bet the fucking house. Yeah. Bet the, bet the fucking house, house I gotta, I gotta baby. Let's go. Yeah. Should we bet the house? No. Well, let's bet the house. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Last week, Bert, yeah. no. Does He's anybody uh. does anybody want to bet one house on the Steelers <laughs> plus one and a half this week? One house, two house, red house, blue house. Um, <laughs> I think Max jo- Mac Jones got banged up in the opener. Also, if I read that correctly, uh, the Patriots stink. Uh, so I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for a two. And a, I thought we were going to start out the season possibly one and four, and it looks like we might start out two and zero. Oh. So yeah. I forgot that they were playing the Pats. This, like that slipped my mind. So no, I don't want him to do well this week. Roger Stevenson, <laughs> that is. I want him to do well. The following right, weeks. moving forward. Okay, so serving Sorry, that, that's sure. why that, I see why you uh, lost your mind there for a second. No, I, that yeah, that's yeah, what I was saying yeah. Because even if they win, I don't want to deal with. With the whole, like... What we uh, went through last week? Yeah, like, my fantasy guy Jeez. is going off against yeah. my favorite team. Like, yeah, right. I Honestly, I'm so biased that outside of having, like, a top three draft pick, if they're playing the Steelers, I just bench them. <laughs> Almost always. 
If it's like a wide receiver well, three, see. running back two, or worse, gotta, I just bench them no, against the Steelers. That's not nice. First of all, Steelers D, lockdown. Yeah, sure. That's not nice. Smart, smart to bench them anyway. Uh, and not secondly, bad. fuck them. They're playing us. Like, I, I, want not, I want no positive benefits from the opposing team doing anything other than going home with their heads hung. How'd your fantasy team do last week? Real shitty. <laughs> Real shitty. I'm not good with the one, number I one have, pick. I have five leagues. I went one and five. Or one and four. Oh, my God. Humbling. One and four, yeah. Humbling. That's okay. It's early. It's early. It is early. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited. We got the Pats at home this week. We got the Browns. I actually might go to this game. Uh, so, Danielle is home in Cleveland right now. Mm. She wants to get tickets. She wants to get sat right in the dog pound. And I said, I don't Elf know how. Pound? I, Elf pound. I, I don't know. How, <laughs> I don't know how comfortable I am with this. Oh yeah, Guapo, if you could go to my Twitter real quick. So, uh, so instead of the Elf pound, it's the workshop. We, we do. <laughs> we, we do have one more thing to talk about. Apparently, Cleveland is changing their midfield logo as if this team isn't a big enough meme in the NFL to begin with. <laughs> so keep the meme they, going, dude. Let's go. They've decided that uh, the the helmet is not good enough, and rather than leaning into their dog pound nickname. They've decided to get uh, Elf Brownie, on the Shelf. Brownie the Elf. Brownie the Elf. They may as well have gotten Brownie a turd to uh, to just... Honestly, that's what they should have done. They should have gotten the is. actual... They should have gotten an actual Brownie cookie that looked a little bit like poo <laughs> and just put it in midfield. Why? Gu- Guapo, do you want to do you want to go ahead and uh, play that five-second clip that I have on my tweet? Because I got to tell you, this is the greatest thing that's ever been created out of Cleveland. I'll see you Sunday. Of sadness. <laughs> I'll see you Sunday. I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> that is that has got to be every single you are Cleveland a fan. Factory of sadness. It's it's such a joke. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I may go to that game. That I, I think that might be the swaying factor it, to getting the Steelers to a four no or a three no start. I you. think uh, you after, individually. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I a think, Matt Berkey appearance. Correct. They need the hometown support. Landon, they need somebody in the dog pound waving a terrible towel, willing to get his face pushed in. Dude, you're gonna in get, order to you're gonna get attacked by like f- at least five people. If I die, I die. If you die, I get the house. Uh, I will say, I <laughs> I do feel like the likelihood of getting attacked, like physically coming into an altercation, if I wear Steelers gear and a terrible towel in the dog pound, is like greater than seventy five percent. Yeah, I would say Danielle like will protect you. Yeah. That's scary. <laughs> it's kind of scary to think about like, oh, I wore my home I, I wore my favorite team's colors to a game and got my face punched. Get mm-hmm. uh get Brandon to come over to the house, teach you some stuff. Mm. <laughs> That's what we need. Brandon will teach you maybe I'll just maybe I'll just invite Brandon as my personal bodyguard. Yeah, you, Brandon, and Danielle. Yeah. Sure. Actually, I, Andre might be back by then. I could just have him like there, ready to roll up on kick anybody. Somebody in the face. Start, shri- exactly. start shrimping on people. Yeah, just, <laughs> just kick some people in Choke the face. Choke some bitches out. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Let's go, dude. <laughs> All right. Yeah. On that note, uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Same time, same channel. Appreciate you guys as always. Please like, comment, subscribe. Leave, uh, leave us a little bit of feedback below. Let us know what your thoughts are with regard to the high roller scene, uh, with regard to Garrett's tweet talking about the work that goes in behind the scenes, uh, as well as uh, do you think the Steelers are going undefeated this year? Because I do. I do not. Uh, I, Dolphins, maybe. Though. I feel pretty confident in it, actually. So, love to hear back from you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you guys all tomorrow. Thanks, Peace. Squat.